Everybody's here and alert, and we're ready to study, to learn, and study His Word and figure some things out and hopefully learn some things that will push us to another level or push us someplace. Maybe you will hear some things today that you've never heard before. Maybe, maybe not. And if you have or have not, hopefully it's something that will provoke us to study and learn about Him more because that's the whole point. That's why we're here. We're not just here to hang out, even though I like hanging out, don't get me wrong, but we're here to learn. This is a school so that we can go and we can minister and be a blessing to other people. So that's our goal. That's our mission in life, and the Lord's going to teach us all something today. So let's pray. Father, we just love you, and I thank you for an opportunity to share. Lord, thank you for the words that will come through my mouth. Lord, I thank you for using me. Lord, I thank you for preparing the hearts of everyone who is here, Lord, to listen and hear from you, Father. I just thank you for answers to questions that we may have had that you're going to answer, Father. I thank you for teaching us how to collaborate, Lord, to bring up questions, Lord, so that we can walk with you better. That's our whole point. That's why we're here, Father. Lord, I thank you for teaching us the connection between the Father the priest and the high priest and the new covenant because that's the mission today and that's what we're going to that's the, the goal that's what we're supposed to learn today blessed are you lord our god king of the universe who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to immerse ourselves in the words of the torah amen Amen. And again, and everyone in here, you know who I am. Hopefully you know. Okay, maybe everybody doesn't know who I am. But my name is Terry Farrell for the benefit of those who are listening online someplace, maybe in China or in Thailand. Hi, somebody in Thailand, China. Anyway, um, I, I absolutely love this. It's an honor to be able to teach. It's an honor to be able to share. So I never want to take it for granted that I get to share. So, um Again, I absolutely love the word. Um, I received the Lord as a young teenager while sitting, sitting on the morning bench at Testarina Primitive Baptist Church in Tallahassee, Florida. It's been a few years ago. Um, but again, that's where my journey, and I say that's where my journey began, but I'm sure it began before that as I was learning and getting to that process. And my point of going all the way back that far I think it starts that way with all of us. All of us, we have a beginning point where we started with our walk with the Lord. And the most important thing on this planet is our relationship with the Lord. That's the most important thing. And as we develop into our relationship with Him, we can share our relationship with others. And if you're a parent, our, most, our, our first, I say our first line, but the first ones that we're going to, I say, proselytize that we're ministering to are our children. We are, it's not an automatic thing. We think it is that your children are going to grow up, that our children are going to grow up and serve the Lord, but it's just not automatic. It's our job to minister to them. We're showing our lives to them. And when we wake up in the morning, we're ministering. We don't think when we walk out the door, then I'm starting to ministry. No, you are ministering every moment of your life. That's what God has called us to do. It's that deep. Yes, I, I can't. It's, but I think it's that deep. When you get out of the bed, when I get out of the bed, I pray because I want to seek God's wisdom on my day. What am I going to do? Lord, what do you want me to do today? Lord, what, I need to align my life up because we are the CEOs of our lives. That's that we are the chief executive officer of our lives. And it's completely up to us how our day goes. And if we start it off with him, it'll end with him. But if we don't, we start off, some of us, they call it, um, they call it decision fatigue. Anybody heard of decision fatigue? There's a lot of articles written on decision fatigue. It's, we make so many decisions in our day that if you make too many decisions later on in the day, you make bad decisions. Because you've made so many horrible, you made so many decisions. It's kind of like, um, I tell you I teach, but sometimes at the end of the day, like at 3 o'clock, sometimes my brain is like mush. <laughs> That's how I think, because it's like you've already been making decisions all day, you're thinking about this. That's why, I don't know if you've seen like um, some of the, um, there's some motivational speakers, and 
who's the other guy? I forgot his name. Is Steve Jobs? Anyway, um, some of these guys they wear the same outfit like every day. Hopefully they wash it, but they have the same type. They wear like same black shirt, blue jeans, and they do this to help with this thing called decision fatigue. It's to it's basically to um, alleviate so many decisions throughout the day to help them to make better decisions. I, I understand what they're doing. I'm not saying you should wear the same thing every day. But my point is, we should lessen our decisions so that we can make better decisions for the Lord. And that's something I have to learn. Like, for, for me, my, myself, sometimes I, I think about things like the moment right before. And that's not good because I put undue pressure on myself. I need to do things the day before so that when I wake up in the morning, I have time to pray. I have time to focus. I'm not thinking about what do I need to get ready for school. I already have it ready in the car. That makes sense? Okay, that's not even on my subject. I'm just kind of off topic there. So let's actually get to the subject. The focus is our relationship with the Lord. We need to first make sure we have our relationship with the Lord first. And if we have a sound relationship with the Lord, we can share that with others. And as we do that, we just need to, it should always be a, it shouldn't be something that we have to do. This should be something that we want to do. If we have to come to congregation, if we have to do this, then that's not, I just don't think that's what God wants us to do. God wants us to be so passionate about learning about him, about, about serving him. So let me actually get to the notes. We're actually going to start on slide eight because this is a continuation from last week. And let me find this in my notes. And good morning for those of you who came in. Okay, let's start on the first priests. We were talking about the priests. And we are, in a sense, priests. If you go to, and if you read 1 Peter 2 9, it talks about God has chosen each one of us. We've been chosen. He said, We're a holy nation. He said, We're a royal priesthood. We're God's own special possession. Why did He call us to do this? Well, He called us to. He said to bring forth the praise of him who called us out of darkness into his light. See, there is a thing that we were at one moment, we were living in death because we were not born again. And then there's another moment that we, well, hopefully there's a moment when we met the Lord and we've transferred over into life. I believe every person, every human being has a relationship with God. It just might not be a good relationship. Think about, think about the enemy. Think about Satan. I know some of y'all looking at me like, whoa, whoa, whoa I don't believe that. Let me, let me make myself clear. Let me, let me explain myself. The enemy believes God, right? In the book of Job, did God have a conversation with, with Satan? So is that a relationship? Yeah, but the difference is he just is not in fellowship with God. I think that's the big, and we could use whatever terms you want to use it, but I believe everybody has a relationship with God. It might be that they say, you know what, I don't want to have nothing to do with God. Maybe when they die, their, their fist is clenched at God and say, you know, I don't want to have nothing to do with you. That is a relationship. It is not a good relationship. But I think all of us, our goal is to develop our fellowship with him. I'm just using that term because I think we need to, some of us have, we can even think of it as levels of fellowship. Maybe you're at level one, wherever level one is. I don't even know if I could name that. Maybe you're at level 10. I think Enoch was at level 10. It says he was and then he, God took him. Wouldn't that be awesome? God's just going to take you. Just, you ain't going to die. You're just going to go on to be with God. That's it. Might scare everybody around, you know. The family's around the bed and you're, you know, you're looking like you're, it's time to go. And all of a sudden you're just gone. Where'd dad go? What's up? He, he just left. But you know what? Why not? I mean, why not? I just say, why not? You know, I just think we need to, our goal is to be that intimate with God. I don't want to ever hear those words, I never knew you. I don't want to hear those words. And I don't think I'm going to hear those words because I have a relationship with God. I commune with him every day. And if you know that, it's nothing new for you. It's nothing that you got to think and make up because you know you got a relationship with God. Right? Does that make sense? All right, let me keep going. All right. The first priests were patriarchal priests, also known as fathers. 
the father was and is to be the priest over his house. I just believe that. And, it, and you can see that in scripture. It's this way now, even if we don't define it as a patriarchal priest. And I wrote this, you, don't, you just don't roll up on someone's property without permission. Think about it. Normally, normally what happens if whoever the head of the household, you don't just come in somebody's property, you normally go and talk to whoever the head of the household. And a lot of times, that's going to be the father. That is, in a way, the priest. And that's what I'm even, not even reading the scripture. It's the father's responsibility that his family is connected and in fellowship with God. I believe that. God is always in the scripture referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In the Amidah, it says, Blessed are you, Lord our God, and God of our fathers, God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We could continue that, right? We should be able to continue that on to our own personal father. We should learn about God through our fathers. And, and when I say that, I'm not excluding mothers. Because we know if the father is the head, the mother is the neck, right? We've heard that, right? But I just believe that's just the truth. We already know that, you know, and that's just the way it is. So when I say the fathers, I'm really including the mothers. But this is the language that, that the scripture normally uses through our fathers. They talk to God through their fathers because their fathers knew God. It's hard on a family if the father does not know God. I just, it's true. It's hard on a family. If I, it's hard on a family if a father knows God. Either way, the, the point is, we have to do our due diligence to minister to our children. That's why as a father, as parents, we are in a way, we are connecting our children to God. Because we're like their priests. Because think about little children. Sometimes kids look at you, you're like a god to them. You're not God, you know that. But that's how they see you. Whatever you say, my dad can do anything. My dad can whatever. Until it comes that moment and they go, you know, my dad maybe may not be so all that. Right? But that's when they should transition and they should have that relationship with God. Y'all see that? All right. We need to do our due diligence to teach our, our young men and women how to worship God. Worship is the most important thing. We do this through doing it ourselves. That's why we need to passionately be about following him. And as we do that, we transfer that relationship. All right, Exodus 12.3. Actually, read some scripture. Exodus 12.3 says, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family one lamb for the household. And I read that because who's taking the lamb? That's the, the, that's the father. He's taking a, a lamb for his household. He's preparing his household. Each man knew that the blood covered his house. He provided for the spiritual well-being for that house. He was a type of priest for his house. He told the men to do this. Revival will start in our world when our men begin to call on the name of the Lord. That's when it's, it's just the way it is. When the man gets it right, it will change his family and other families as well. It's not just his family when the man gets it right. It's going to change people around him. Because you might not have any children, but there's children all over this world. Pick some. Okay, let me tell you. Just go into a school. Just go to a playground. You ain't got to look far. There's children all over the place. You ain't even got to think children. Just think about peers. Because there's a lot of people who are fatherless even though they're an adult. That means nothing. That just means they're an adult that's fatherless. They didn't have someone there. And I, when I say father, I want to think of a figure who's going to connect you to God. Because sometimes you have a father who's a sperm donor. Oh, yeah, I had to go there. Okay? That's just the way it is. That's just the truth. That's why we need fathers who are worshiping God. And we have those fathers. We have them all over this congregation. We have all kind of awesome fathers and men figures here who are worshiping God and that's how we are connecting people to him when you get the head the entire body will turn the enemy has an attack on our males and I believe that I think it's prophetic and I got some statistics here um, male babies are more likely to die at birth you know that that's the truth that's just statistics I didn't make it up I promise look it up use Dr. Google I love that all right Males have higher death rates from many causes. I thought this was interesting. There's a lot of them. If you look it up, it's 
kind of is it's just the truth. It's just the way it is. statistics is very um, it's not personal. It just gives you the data. It just it is what it is. Like in this room, there's probably I don't know. I'm making this up. Maybe there's 68 percent females in this room. Is that personal? It's not personal at all. It has nothing. It's just numbers. You can argue with it all you want. I don't believe it's sick. Whatever, okay? You're arguing with the wall, okay? I can count them. We can do the math. That's what it is. So that's statistics. All right. Another statistic, males also commit 77.9% of all suicides. That's a lot. It says, how, I thought this was interesting. However, the female population are more likely to have thoughts of suicide than males. So maybe they just think about it. Guys just do it, huh? I don't know. Which is bad, but my point is, I think it's prophetic that there is an all-out attack on the male seed. Because guess what? If the enemy knows he can get to the male, he got the rest of the clan. It's really that simple. Take out the men, everybody's going down. So we need to be able to see our enemy. And if we understand and know this, we know, uh, if you know the attack, if you are, um, any, nobody here, I don't see anybody as a coach. If you're a coach, and you coach basketball, you want to make sure you study the other team, right? You want to know when they're going to go left, when they're going to go right. And guess what? They study, they watch film like all day, those coaches. I mean, they're kind of, I tell them, y'all kind of sad, okay? Get a life, okay? Do something else. I just harass them. But again, but, but they're doing that because if you know your enemy, it makes it so much easier for you to win. We need to know our enemy. And there's an all-out attack on the male seed. I just believe that. And if we know that, that's why we need to be praying. We need to do things to help our young men, our young, to help them to connect to God, however that is. And we need to know that's our mission. We, of course, obviously, are our young ladies as well, but I'm just focusing today on the men. That's my goal. All right, Genesis 2.18 says, Then Adonai Elohim said, It is not good for the man to be alone. Let me make a well-matched Helper for him. Notice they focus on the male. A help meet, a helper for him. When that man is turned around, turn around. I was anyway. All right. When that man is turned around, the woman will generally flow in that same direction. It is difficult for a woman to be a helper for a man that's not going anywhere. Let me read that again. It's difficult for a woman to be a helper for a man that's not going anywhere. How can I help you do nothing? I am the assistant nothing. That's why our men, we need, to be, we need to be worshiping the Lord. We need to be following him. And guess what? It's all going to come into play. That's just how it works. That's why it's so important that men begin to worship and call on the name of the Lord. Um, remember, worship is everything that you do. Worship is not just coming singing. I worship. That's great. But that's just a small part. That's good. That's important. Exodus 34, 21 says that six days shall you work. Exodus 8, 1 says, let my people go so that they may worship me. Joshua 24, 15 says, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That word work, worship, and serve, they're all the same Hebrew word, which is avodah. So that's why I'm just defining worship. Worship is not just singing. Worship is when you go to work and you make the paycheck, because the scripture says if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat, right? That's just the way it is. That's the scripture. We need to be working. We need to be creating for six days. As we're, and I say working, because working, you might not be like doing manual labor, but you're creating. You're doing things for the Lord. You're, you're, you're creating this. You're building this. You're an entrepreneur. You're whatever you're doing for six days. On the seventh day, you're supposed to rest. And that was, that's his pattern. All right, slide nine. Do you see any chairs in the tabernacle or temple for the priests? No. I love this picture. It just comes out of the, the, the building over there. I just took a picture of it. Um, we are ministers to serve. That's our job. We need to be in awe of his presence so that we can take this awe to the rest of humanity to our families first. We need to be in awe. I love this because you see the priests, they're just laid out. They're just in his presence. And the priests, they didn't just come there to chill. They were working. They were singing. They were taking the ash out of the whatever. They were doing this. They were making the showbread. They were lighting the, they were working. They didn't just come there to hang out. They were, this is what, this is what we're supposed to be doing. 
in here at Congregation Beth and I, there's a lot of places to serve, right? Oneg ministry, greeters, um, teachers, um, ushers, sound. We got so many places to serve that there's no excuse. I think once you come, I think it's a great idea to come to any congregation and just sit for like a year to learn, to be under the ministry. But after that, you need to get to work. It's time to, it's time to do something. You're not just here to fill up a seat and sit back and chill. And I, I like seeing everybody's smiling face, but whatever. We need to be doing something. That's what we're called to do. It's kind of like if somebody comes over my house and we have guests. The first few times you're a guest. After that, I'm putting you to work, okay? Um, here you go. I want you to be involved. Because when you work, do you feel more involved? Yeah, you do feel more. You don't just feel like you just come here to chill. Mm, I, I don't play that, especially kids. If I'm outside working and you've been here a few times, you're coming out there to work with me. Here go a rake, buddy. Let me show you how to do this, okay? And that's just, you know, and I got that from my dad. My dad is a hard worker, and he definitely passed that on to me. And I was the kid that would go, and I, I was supposed to go and, Maybe I was supposed to cut the grass. I was the one that would go to the bathroom for like an hour. Terry, where you at? Uh, I was just in the bathroom. So I was that kid, okay? I was the one that tried to avoid it. But you know what? It's okay if they try to avoid it. Keep making them do it because it's going to stick in. Same thing with worship. Same thing with coming to congregation. Sometimes we make our young kids do things. We think, oh, it's not, it's not sticking. It's sticking. They're listening. Sometimes they look like they're not listening, but they're listening. We just need to keep telling them, keep saying it. We need to keep being consistent. Don't allow their inconsistency change who we are. And that's for everybody because people will throw you off all day. When you go to work in the morning, you're like, I'm just going to go back home because I don't even want to be around these people. Anybody feel like that when you go to work? Maybe it's just me, okay? I'm just, I, anyway, i just like, what in the world did I just walk into? That's why in my mind, I say I have to be prayed up when I go to school when I go to work, because you don't know who you're going to encounter. You don't know what you're going to run into. Maybe somebody who you just passed by, they were contemplating suicide. And maybe you said hello to them, and that just changed their world. Because nobody said hello to them. Nobody even noticed them. You'd be surprised. Sometimes I say hello to kids i never seen before in my life. Hey, man, I like that shirt. Now, I just made a best friend. I didn't, know I, I didn't know I made a best friend. But now you come, hey, what's up, Miss Farrell? What's, you know, I didn't even know that. But it doesn't even, what matters is we are doing our due diligence. That's why we need to be prayed up because God is using us in these last days as priests to connect people to God. That's our job. All right, let me actually get back to my notes. If you're not married, then you are the priest to connect someone to him. This is our job as a holy nation, royal priesthood, God's special possession. When Adam fell into sin, the family fell. Creation fell when the men fell. Creation fell when the men fell. That's what, if you read the scripture, that's what it says. Out of the fallen family came murder. Out of dysfunction comes dysfunction. Just the way it works. Not all the time, just depends, but most of the time. We all come out of some type of dysfunctional Situation. I can't look at everybody's life, but a lot of us, and even if you didn't come out of a dysfunctional situation, go back to your great, 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 great granddaddy Adam and Eve. Okay, so I just included all of us. We all came out of a dysfunctional situation. That's just the way it is. After studying the book of Job, I understand that stuff can happen to any of us. Just thank God for what you know and learn and move on. Stay humble. Things happen to us. Sometimes we want to figure it out. I wonder why this person got cancer. Just shut up. You don't know. You can try to figure it out if you want to. Wonder why this happened to this person. We just need to be in place to pray for people, to help people, to minister to people, to help connect people to God. A lot of times it's just not up to us to, to figure that out. And matter of fact, I just think it's draining. It's kind of wasted energy to me. I mean, we talked about decision fatigue. That's those decisions that we're thinking about that we don't even need to worry about. Just let God can handle that. He, he got it. I think he can figure it out. Genesis 4. Adam was intimate with, with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son. And she named him Seth. For God has appointed me another seed in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. To Seth was born a son. He named him Enosh. Then people began to call on Adonai's name. I think this is where I left off last week. I was trying to make a good connect. So it says... At that, so it, we know 
that Cain killed Abel, right? We're not going into that story. But at this point it says, Seth was born and people began to call on Adonai's name. So that means before that, the line of Cain, they were not calling on Adonai's name. Does that make sense? I think that's very clear. So by them including it, it's excluding the other. Note at this point, men began to call on the name of the Lord through Seth and not through Cain. So what happened through Cain? I don't know. All kind of stuff. Who knows? Idol worshipers. I don't know. A lot of stuff. And I think we talked about this last week. Um, Seth starts a generational blessing. The father. This is, a, this is his priestly function. And this is before the temple. This is before the temple. They were offering sacrifices before the temple. Where were they offering sacrifices? I don't know. I think the scripture doesn't say a lot about it. Um, I think there are some apocryphal books that I was talking to somebody about um, last week that probably has a lot to say about this. And I say apocryphal. I think there's a lot of like the book of Enoch. Anybody look at the book of Enoch that is actually mentioned in the scripture? And there's other books that are mentioned that are in line, I think, with the scripture. And I think it's okay to read them. I read them. Matter of fact, before, what was the year? I remember in, I think it was 1885. Before that, the King James Version of the Bible It had all the apocryphal books in them with it, but they took them out. Why did they take them out? I'm not even going there. That's another class. But you get the point. I think it's okay to read them and to discern for yourself because that's what we're here to do. I'm not here to just follow. And I think I said this before. um, I, I really love studying from the Jewish people, but everything that's Jewish does not make it Godish. Does that make sense? They could be going in the wrong direction. Everything that's Christian doesn't make it Godish either. Because there's a lot of things that's on both sides. That's why we need to do our diligence to follow him and learn from him. It's our, we're learning. We're doing our walk. It's completely us. And I, I like to tell people this. I thoroughly, I respect everybody's relations. If you have a relationship with the Lord, I respect your relationship. But I could be completely wrong. That's why you're here to listen to me and we need to be like the Bereans. It said that they studied the things if they were thus or so. Don't just take anybody's word for it. That's crazy. We should never take somebody's. You should learn. You should read. You should do your own research and follow. Anyway, um, Genesis 4, 6 says, Then Adonai said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, it will lift. But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the doorway. Its desire is for you. You must master it. And again, I think we talked about these um, generations here. I like to point out, go down to, I didn't even put it on here. But I like to point out during Abraham's time, Shem was still alive. And that's because they lived many, many years. And there's a lot of Jewish sages, and I agree with them, that Melchizedek was probably Shem. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Because when it says Melchizedek, I think Melchizedek is like a title. It's not necessarily his name was Melchizedek. It could be just a t- kind of like the high priest. Was his name the high priest? No, his name was not the high priest. His name was Aaron. His name was all the other names of the different high priests. So Melchizedek could possibly just be a title. So that's why he could be Shem. It could have been Shem. Anyway, we'll leave that alone. Y'all may agree or not agree. Don't throw any rocks at me. Okay, anyway. All right, let's keep going. All right, Moses began to function as a high priest when he was able to go in and come out from the presence of God. He was able to get a glimpse of his presence. I think he just got a glimpse of his presence. I don't think we know. Matter of fact, I don't think we know the Shekinah, the, 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 and, and the first time I heard the word, I called it Shekinah for a long time. Anyway, it's the Shekinah glory. <laughs> Sorry, it's Shekinah. I believe that's how you pronounce it. But I don't think we know the, the glory. And we don't know God like we'll know it until we get to heaven. I think we get a glimpse of it. Because think about it. Just, just think about God for just a second. God created this entire universe it's still expanding at the rate of 186,000 miles per second. It's expanding since he created it. Okay, 
I can't even, my brain just goes tilt thinking about that. So guess what? I just think we have just a small glimpse. And I'm grateful for a small glimpse. I, that's why the scripture talks about the sacrifices. They were just, it was just a way for us to draw near to him. That's all the sacrifices were. If you look at that word sacrifice, it's korban. And korban literally just means drawing near. I need a way to draw near to this awesome God. And if that's to go get a lamb, and if there's a temple, I'm going to get some lambs. I'm going to get all the lambs I can get. We're, give me some lambs, some rams, all of that. Because I want, to, I want to draw near to him. Again, I think that's our highest calling to be in his presence, to walk with him. I would love to have the Enoch experience, to just walk with, I'm walking and I'm gone. Y'all hear me talking like, yes, praise the Lord. And I'm, I always joke with my students, I say, um, I'm solving an equation, and then God just takes me. Like, what happened? He just left. Maybe a lot of people get saved at that moment, okay? I'm just going to give my life to the Lord right now. Anyway, all right, let's keep going. Slide 12. All right, Exodus 3. And he said, I am the God of your father, father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. See, he's connecting through the fathers. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. I can't even, I don't even understand it. I think this picture is just trying to show us you know, a visualization, but we really don't know how it, we don't know how it looked. We just know what the scripture is telling us. But it says he was afraid to look at God. Moses was privileged and honored and the humblest man on the earth. Why? Because the scripture says that. And that's why I know that most likely Moses is the one that wrote that down, because I'm sure God was telling him to write it down. Moses is most likely the, run, the one that wrote that Moses was the humblest man on the earth. How do you think about that? So what? But think about it. God was probably like, Moses, write it down. Moses like, no, I'm not right. Moses, write it down. That's why I believe that it came. Another reason that is evidence that that came from God. Why would I write about myself and say, I'm the humblest man on this earth? That wouldn't even make sense, right? That's why I believe that God was, he spoke and told Moses and he wrote it. He wrote it down. Anyway, we'll leave that alone. You might fight me on that too. Just fight me later. All right. Um, he was able to draw near to God and see God in a way that we may never see him. Maybe in heaven. Moses then. So it was Moses, then Aaron. Now we're talking about the high priest. Moses really wasn't a high priest. You could call him a high priest, but he really wasn't. But he was the first one that kind of instituted that. And then after Moses was Aaron, then all of Aaron's sons. And then it goes on down to history. And then it started to get corrupt. I won't even go there, but that, it started getting corrupt later on in history. It says, why was there a need for a high priest? I thought about that question for like a day. I said, why is there a need for a high priest? There is a need, I believe. But I think it's okay to ask God those types of questions. It's okay, it's okay to, if you don't understand something, I think, to ask God, help me to get this. Because I don't know. Because sometimes we try to go to other sources instead of just asking God. And we can ask God, you know what, he'll show us in his way. He'll show us, maybe he'll show you through a teaching. Maybe he'll show you in your morning prayer time. But God is going to, I think, he'll show us an answer for everything that we want an answer to. Because I think he's that great. I think he's that awesome. Anyway, let me keep going. So today's big question, why did we need priests? And this is something I got in an article, but I thought it was fitting. It says, do you, know that, do you know what the leading cause of death is in the world? Kind of a joke. It's life. Get it? Life. All right. This is because everyone is a sinner, and the wages of sin is death. Everyone is born into this death. You can't avoid it. Every person who is conceived, who is conceived dies. It's a, it's a fact. How many times have we seen someone pin his hopes on another person, only to be disillusioned when that person finally meets their end. Think about it. Pinning our hopes on people is never going to bring true fulfillment and satisfaction. This is why the priests of Israel could never be the answer for our sin problem. Read that again. Pinning our hopes on people is never going to bring true fulfillment and satisfaction. This really helped me. This is why the priests of Israel could never be the answer for our sin problem. See, we're born into sin. So there had to be something that removed us out of this death into life. 
But our sin problem could not be answered through men. I believe that. That makes sense to my brain. This is why the high priest, God, I read that. They could only point to the answer. They could, they could only be a picture, a shadow, or a copy of the real answer. And as you read the scripture, you see that all over the place. I think it's just yelling Yeshua. It's yelling the Messiah. In Genesis, I brought this. I wanted to read this at this point. Glad I remember. This is an awesome book. Um, it's called Yeshua by Yaakov Ramsel. And he points out how Yeshua is in every book of the scripture. And I'll read this. I've said this before. In Genesis, we see Yeshua as the beginning, the promised redeemer and the seed of the woman. In Exodus, we see Yeshua as the Passover and the deliverer of God's people. In Leviticus, we see Yeshua as the high priest. Is he the high priest? Absolutely. Every aspect, but it's a copy. It's a shadow. It's just pointing. It's just pointing to the Messiah. In Numbers, we see Yeshua as the pillar of cloud by day, fire by night, and the manna on high. In Deuteronomy, we see Yeshua as a prophet like unto Moses. I'm not going to read all this, but he goes through from Genesis to Revelation on how Yeshua is in every aspect of the scripture. And I just think that's awesome. It's kind of like you over here, um, if you're outside somewhere and you see a fire, you hear a fire truck coming and you hear the noise in the way in the distance. Okay, I'm going to try to make noise. You hear, what just happened? It came and it gone. I think that's how we hear the Messiah. That's the scriptures. We see the Messiah. Messiah is coming. Messiah is coming. Messiah is coming. He came. Messiah came. Does that make sense? It's the same thing to me. That's how I see it. The scripture is yelling out, Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. Every Jew is messianic. Some of them just don't believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. And hopefully some of them that are listening right now are going to change that. Because guess what? Yeshua is the Messiah. And if you don't believe that, again, I, don't, I just think you won't benefit from knowing that he is the Messiah. But we need the Messiah to connect to the new covenant. See, if you don't know the Messiah, you are not a part of the new covenant. And I'm getting ahead of myself. But anyway, but if you don't know the Messiah, I believe that Adam and Eve were a part of the new covenant. I believe that Abraham was a part of the new covenant. Moses was a part of the new covenant. You said, didn't the new covenant just come when Jesus came? I don't believe that. Because it, it said that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. That was Abraham. I think Abraham is well before Yeshua, right? And if not, we need to do some Bible study and learn that. Okay. Anyway, Abraham is well before Yeshua. So the point is, that the new covenant started all the way back then. All the other covenants that we're going to talk about, I think they're just a description of the covenant that already started all the way back with Adam and Eve. He's just telling us what it's always been. It didn't change. God doesn't change. The scripture all over the place says that God does not change. I don't see if we can be any more clear about that. He said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. All right, and I'm off my notes. Let me get back to my notes. Um, no satisfaction was found in the priests except for the fact that every action they were required to perform pointed to that which would result in ultimate satisfaction. Who could fulfill the priesthood? Who could be the undying priest? Think about that. Who could, we know who the undying priest is. It's the Messiah. Jesus was not a normal priest. He was and is... He was a priest in the order of Melchizedek. That's why he had to be the undying priest. Someone who, from the Levitical priesthood, they could not connect us to life. It wasn't. It was just a glimpse. It's just a shadow. Who could be the undying? I read that. Jesus was not a known priest. He was a priest in the order of Melchizedek. We read in Genesis 14 that Melchizedek was a king. Hebrews also tells us that Melchizedek had no recorded, recorded, Sorry, my country. Recorded beginning and no recorded ending. This is a great picture of Yeshua who fulfilled the priesthood. He is not only priest, but he also is king. He is the one without beginning and end because he is God. He is fully God and he is fully man. When Yeshua went into the Holy of Holies as our once and for all sacrifice, he had completed all the requirements of the priesthood. 
See, he didn't go in every year. He just did it once, and that was it. And he did this in the heavenlies. I believe there's a heavenly Torah. I won't even go there. The scripture talks about a heavenly Torah. I believe the Torah, I, trust me, I believe the Torah that we have is just, but I believe there's also a heavenly Torah, which is really saying the same thing, but I'm sure some things that we've never heard for in our lives. And I can't wait to get to heaven to hear about it. It's going to be great. All right. He had completed all the requirements of the priesthood. He was without, I read that. Um, he was without beginning and without sin took on our sins, suffered the wrath of, an, wrath of an eternally righteous God, rose from the grave in full victory, and is now exalted forevermore. Yeshua is an entirely different priest. There is, there is no need for another to come after him because he will never die. Could that fit the description of a person, human being? No. It's just not happening. All our hope is our great substitute. The actions of many priests for the Jews has been superseded by one great high priest for all people. And now we all share with our kingly priests in being his royal priesthood. That is just so awesome to me. Again, so the fathers connected us to God. The, pri the priests, as, as a priest, because we are the royal priesthood, we connect to God in that way as well. Not necessarily your children, but you're connecting the entire world. The high priest, I believe that office was instituted, at least this is the answer that I got, was so that we can transfer from death to life. That can't come from a person. That only can come from the Messiah. We can't do that. Hebrews 8.5, they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown on the mountain. Y'all get the heavenly Torah out of that? Let me read that again. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Heavenly. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything, everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. So God showed Moses everything about the temple when he was on the mountain, when he was walking with him. But again, I believe there's even a greater one which is in heaven. There's a, that's why I believe there's a heavenly Torah. And there's scripture that backs that up. I don't know if we're going to get to it today. We'll try. Hebrews 9, 12. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. The veil was torn from the top down. I love that. Why was it torn from the top down? Because that was God. If it was from the bottom up, we could accuse and say, well, maybe some men came. Uh -uh. It was from the top down. And the, oh, I, I don't know the dimensions of the veil, but it was, a, it was huge. It wasn't something that you could just jump up there and rip. It was, it was a huge veil that separated the Holy of Holies in the holy place. Again, it was torn from the top down. All right, my next question is, what is the difference between a priest and a Levite? And it says, let's think about Luke 10. Specifically, I was wondering why verse 31 has a priest and verse 32 has a Levite. I thought a Levite was a priest. What's the difference here? And I'm going to read verse 31, 32. It says, and by chance, a priest was going down on that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also. This is the story of the Good Samaritan. See, a lot of scriptures don't use priest or Levite, but they were priest and Levite. Let me read it again. And by chance, a priest was going down on the road, on that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him and passed by on the other side. So we had a priest and a Levite. The passage to which reference is made is the parable of the Good Samaritan. In short, all priests are Levites, being selected from the tribe of Levi, but not all Levites are priests. And those Levites who are not priests were assigned duties. And I'm not going to read through all this, but again, um, remember the Levites, they had a lot of jobs to do. They were very busy. So, let's go on down to slide. Uh-oh. My PowerPoint changed. Uh, 
Okay. Um, this is just a picture of the tabernacle, which is really important. But let's get to this because of time. All right, Romans 9, 5 says, To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, the Messiah, who is overall God blessed forever. And the them they're talking about, we're talking about the Jewish people. That's why it's so important to learn from the Jews, because there's so much knowledge that, and there's, there's so many oral traditions that we may not necessarily know, that we may not get unless we get that from someone who's been studying the scripture for years. It's kind of like going to a doctor, and this doctor um, has been practicing medicine for 30 years. Do you think you need to learn from them? Yes, unless you're a fool. You should learn from somebody who has been doing something for many years. That's why it's so important to learn from the Jews. But again, don't get it twisted and say that everything that we're getting from the Jews is what we should be doing. That's why we need to discern for ourselves. It's important to learn. Ephesians 2, at that time, and this is important, it's all important. At that time, you were separate from Messiah. At that time. Can you remember at that time that you were separate from Messiah? Can you go back and say, you know what, when was the moment that I did not know the Messiah? When was that moment that I was not saved? We should be able to go back and think about that moment. Excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. See, we can't claim the promises of God unless you are a part of Israel. Uh-oh. Yes, I'm going there. Okay, I'll wait in a minute. But we, I believe, when you are grafted in, you are grafted into Israel. That's who we are. And I believe those who are Israel by birth they are in a way regrafted in because they have to know the Messiah. It's not something that, okay, I'm born Israel, I'm born a Jew. And this is the perception that some Jews have. Matter of fact, some have an arrogance and say, you know what, I'm a Jew. So I really don't need to know who the Messiah is. Well, I think that's wrong. That's just incorrect and it's not accurate. I believe even if you're Jew, if you're not Jew, you need to know the Messiah. If not, you are not in this group that we can call Israel or we can say the body of Messiah or we can say the ecclesia or you get the point I like to just say God's family because sometimes we get into those names and we exclude people because we start saying this name here be, oh no I'm not Israel oh no I'm not Christian I'm just it ain't even worth all that to me the whole point is I am walking with the Lord I am in God's family Period. If you want to go and argue about those names, have at it. I ain't got time. I want to follow him. Let me keep going. All right. You have a covenant with God. Do you believe you have a covenant with God? Yes. If you are in Messiah, you have a covenant with God. If you have made Yeshua the Lord of your life, you can claim every promise that God made towards Israel. Because we have a covenant with God. And I believe if we knew we had a co if we really knew we had a covenant with God, it will change the way we walk. It'll change the way we talk because I know that I am connected with God. I know He. It's kind of like if I gave, I say, you know what? Um, I'm your um, rich uncle, and I have an inheritance for you of five million dollars. How many of y'all think you might act a little different? Don't lie. Okay, come on. Don't lie. Don't lie. That, nah, I wouldn't act different. You are lying, okay? You are lying. Some of y'all might get up right now and just leave. I got to go. See y'all. Talk to you later. Okay? But it should be the same way when we know we have a covenant with God. Because you can claim every promise that he gave us. He promised us long life. Do you think that's a big promise? That's better than money. Keep your money. I want the long life. How many millionaires we see commit suicide? Because money doesn't fulfill you. What fulfills you? God fulfills you, knowing your purpose, knowing you have a covenant with him, knowing that you're right with God. That's all that matters. If I know I'm right with God, y'all are cool and all, but honestly, y'all don't matter, okay? I like each one of y'all. Maybe some of y'all. Just, I'm just y'all guy. But my point is, if you have a covenant with God, that's what matters. That's why we need to, and this is a whole other topic, that's why it's, we need to get away from people bondage. Because you could be so 
and I talked about this, I think, last week in my Aliyah, I got a chance to talk about it, but you can be so soul tied to someone that you walk away from your relationship with God. So that soul tie is moving you away because the point is, is just to walk with him. It's that simple. We just mess it up by whatever. And that's just the way it is. And we're running out of time. All right, let me get to the conclusion. And my conclusion um, for today is I started off just talking about we need to have a relationship with God. That's the most important thing. Once you have a relationship, make sure you have a relationship with God. Do what you need to do and, and work on your relationship. Then we need to connect others to have a relationship with God. That means you are the priest in somebody's life. I don't know who that is. Maybe you're the priest in your child's life. Maybe, hopefully you're the priest in your child's life. Maybe you're the priest in somebody else's child's life. Maybe you're the priest in your co-worker's life. And the priest's job was to connect men to God. That's our job. That's what we do. The high priest's job, I believe, was there to connect us from death to life. And that could only be done by the Messiah. That couldn't be done by somebody on the earth. That's why I believe the high priest on earth was a copy and a shadow. Like I talked about the fire truck, it's just showing that Messiah is coming. Messiah is coming. Messiah is coming. Messiah is here. That was the whole point of the, of the high priesthood. In the new covenant, I believe that everyone who has accepted the Messiah as Lord of their life, you are part of the new covenant. But there's actually a national component to the new covenant. I don't believe that, I'm going to throw this out there as I part, I don't believe the new covenant is just individual. I believe it has a national component. I don't believe the new covenant is complete until Paul said that all Israel will be saved. What did he mean by that? Does he mean every single individual in Israel will be saved? That was tough. And that's in Jeremiah. But I believe it said, I think there's going to come a day that we will be able to say that Israel is saved. Does that mean that everybody is saved in Israel? No. We know that's not the case. I can say this, and I'll give you an example. Do all men have arms? Not necessarily, but can we just, is that something that we could say? You could say all men have arms, but do all men have arms? No. I think there's, why did I use that example? I just think there's coming a day when we will be able to say that all of Israel is saved. We're just going to know it. It's just some things you're going you're to know. In Jeremiah, it said, in Jeremiah, it talks about in that day, all will know the Lord. We will know. It even talks about, and some people can get, I say, twisted and say, you know what, we don't need teachers in the last days because that's what Jeremiah says, right? No, that's not what it's saying at all. I believe it's saying, when I say I know somebody, I know you, but I can still learn about you. It's like I know my wife. We've been married for 26 years. We've known each other for 27 years. I know her. As I tell her, I know you better than anybody on this planet except God, okay? That's just... Because we've known each other for many years. There's a lot of things I know. Do you think there's a lot of things I don't know about her? Probably. There's probably a lot of things I don't know about her. Can I learn? Maybe she wrote. She didn't. She should one day. Maybe she wrote a book. You think it would be important for me to read her book? To learn about her? Yes. I want to read her book so I can. Re That's why we need to keep learning. The scripture talks about in Jeremiah. It says no one will need to teach his fellow. But that's not what it means. It just means that at one, in this time, I believe when it all comes to completion, we will all know the Lord. You don't even have to think about it. We're going to know the Lord. This, it's going to be like, it's going to be this cut and dry. It's going to be like, you're following God or you're not. And it's going to be very clear. And we're going to know that. I think, I think prophetically now you can see that. You can see the lines being drawn. The line is there. We know. You know those. At least we know. I don't even like to get in that too much. But you can kind of know who's following the Lord and who's not following the Lord. And I think, it's, I think that's the national, the, the national component of the new covenant. And the, the sages like to call it already done, not yet. That means salvation is already done, but not yet. Because there's a national component to salvation. And the national component is because all Israel 
will be saved. And I believe that Paul said that, and it's all over the scripture that because Israel is the apple of God's eye. Why would he, why would he not save all of Israel? I think that's, that's the minimum. So, okay, let's pray, and then we'll have a little time before service. Father, I just thank you for your word. Thank you for an opportunity to share, Lord. Thank you, hopefully, that we've opened someone's eyes to just follow you more, to follow you better, to have a relationship with you. Lord, maybe I, I stepped on some toes. I like stepping on toes. Lord, maybe I, I provoked somebody to, to, to just be better with you, Lord, to walk with you, Lord, so that we can connect others to you, because that's the whole point, Lord. And I thank you for this fire that's on the inside of each one of us, Lord. I just pray that you stoke it through others talking to us and conversation, Lord. And I give you praise for everything you're going to do. In Yeshua's name, amen.